Welcome back to Historia Ecclesiastica. We are continuing the video I just started, really, only about half an hour ago. Uh, how did the Last Supper become the Latin Rite Mass? I didn't realize the video would have to be in two parts, but it got very long in part one. And I was planning on filming the other half next week, but I was kind of excited because, uh, you know, I think that the next part's very, very interesting, so I just thought I would finish it tonight. Went out, got a little blizzard from my wife and I. That's all in my belly now, so let's get started with part two of how did the Last Supper become the Latin Rite Mass. Um, please go ahead and uh, like, comment, subscribe, and share. And uh, once again, this video can also be found as a podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And if you didn't watch part one, go ahead and watch part one to see how um, the Last Supper, the institution of the Eucharist by Jesus Christ, uh, was slowly developed to add uh, fitting ceremonies because um, the, the theology of that Eucharist was that Jesus was truly giving us a way to uh, represent to the Heavenly Father his flesh and blood. And if you don't like that, that Jesus did that, if you think that, no, it's just a cognitive memor like a memory service where we think about Jesus, well, um, take that up with the literal words of Christ in the Gospels. Take that up as well with the early church, because uh, if you watch that original video, you're going to find just numerous passages from church fathers and early church documents confirming that it truly was the orthodox belief of the church of the first, second, and third century that the uh, bread and wine of the Eucharist truly becomes the body and blood of Christ, the flesh and blood of Christ, and it truly was a sacrifice. So um, if you think that Catholics are heretics for believing that, you're condemning the entire early church. <clears throat> so where we left off was we were talking about the, um, as the culture was changing in Rome, there was a slow, gradual process by which the Roman liturgy, which was in Greek for the first uh, three centuries, was becoming more and more Latin. And that leads us to the 314 with Emperor Constantine's conversion. So Emperor Constantine's conversion was a, a bit of a historical shock, and historians still recognize it as... Um, an event that really had no, uh, there was no reason historically to think that that would have happened other than God's intervention. Constantine converted and immediately the church was given peace in the Edict of Milan and it was favored as well with his enormous wealth. You know, Constantine wasn't just great for being a Christian um, emperor, he was also a very effective emperor. He brought peace and stability to the empire in general, which had been in chaos throughout the entire third century with um, some, something like all but a couple of the emperors were, died in office, were either killed in battle or assassinated. So a great period of great unrest, and uh, Constantine brought order to the emperor empire, and uh, with his wealth that he accrued through being the emperor of both the eastern and the western empire, he especially patronized the church. Uh, he financed the construction of numerous basilicas for use for public worship, but he especially wanted to show specific honor to the Church of Rome. He himself did not live in Rome. As the emperor of both the Eastern and the Western Empire, he set up his capital in Byzantium, which would be rebuilt and turned into the city of Constantinople in his honor. But he did give uh, large amounts of money to the Pope so that the Pope could build basilicas in Rome. And uh, the most famous of those was Old St. Peter's Basilica, which no longer stands. It was replaced with, uh, of course, the current St. Peter's Basilica. This here is a uh, construction of what Old St. Peter's Basilica would have looked like, perhaps. It, this doesn't show quite the size of it. It was enormous, but it wasn't quite as uh, grand as the, the current St. Peter's Basilica was. But in its basic structure, it looked very similar, and it was over the same location as uh, uh, as St. Peter's Tomb, as the current St. Peter's Basilica is. So that's St. Peter's Basilica in 330 A.D. I want to look at that specifically because, and all these churches that were built in the 300s and 400s, because all of them reflect the really the first opportunity that the church had to construct their own permanent temples. Before then, as a persecuted religious group, um, they would try to adorn large estates of the uh, wealthier Catholics to be fitting for public worship, but this was their first chance to design and build their own temples to reflect their theology of the Eucharist. And this is what we have. Huge, magnificent, finely adorned temples in which the altar is found at the far eastern end. The altar faces ad orientum, facing the east. 
and um, the sacrificial nature of the Mass is far and above emphasized over the meal essentials of the Mass. So we don't see a big banquet hall. We see a big basilica. Uh, a basilica in Roman architectural style, um, this was a public meeting house for public like town hall meetings, you might say. So they did not choose the architecture of the pagan temples, which were much smaller and weren't used to having a huge congregation gathering. So there was a sense that the Mass was something that the people take part in, as they are required to, on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. But at the same time, um, we could see they could have gone with a large banquet hall if they really wanted to emphasize the meal. Instead, they emphasized the sacrifice as well as the nature that the entire community should be there present and assisting at the sacrifice. So just look at how each of the churches we're going to look at here from the uh, 4th and 5th centuries built in Rome reflect that theology of sacrifice. This is St. John Lateran's uh, cathedral, the official cathedral church of the Pope ever since the very beginning of the, ever since here, 324 AD. Um, so very similar in its basic structure to uh, old St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, St. Paulo Fiori Le Muera. St. Paul of the Mount, of the Fountains. I said in an earlier video that uh, legend says this is where St. Paul was martyred, where this church was built. Well, quite quite well might be. Similar style. Large basilica style. The whole community can gather, but the sacrifice is taking place at a very sacrificial looking altar, not a table. Facing the east. We have a uh, Santa Pudenziana. This was the original papal cathedral. It was, in fact, a house church. And uh, once the uh, Constantine offered, or the Latterini family donated their estate to the Pope so that he could build his cathedral at St. John Lanner. And, and, um, but before that, this is where his cathedral was. Now, they did destroy the old house in which um, his house church used to be, and they replaced it with a, with a cathedral in the 4th century. Uh, Santa Maria Maggiore here. This is very uh, Baroque um, art, but the, the church is old, dating to the year 434 AD. Santa Sabina, similar style as we've seen, and uh, Santa, Costan Santa Costanza, which was an imperial chapel, and so you can see it has a more of a circular shape, and this was because the empire, the emperor and his court and his family would gather and uh, take part in the sacrifice here. So adornments of the Mass in general, apart from the architecture that we just observed. Throughout the Catholic Church in the Mediterranean, I'm saying in the Mediterranean to distinguish it because there, there was the Chaldean Church, there was the Syro-Malabar Church this time, so there was the Ethiopian Church that was still gathering, uh, that was still meeting ever since they were evangelized, since the Apostles, but the Church in the Mediterranean was enjoying a time of peace because of Constantine's conversion. And uh, this allowed the uh, Christians throughout the entire Catholic Church to begin to incorporate more and more ceremonies and rituals which adorned the holiness of the sacrifice. In general, the Greek-speaking churches embraced the, uh, the basically the pietistic, the piety of the Greek people, the emphasizing the mysterious and the poetic, and the Latin-speaking churches of the West emphasized the piety and the uh, religious genius of the Roman people. You know, piety is a, a natural virtue. So even when it was directed towards pagan deities, uh, expressing piety towards false gods is still in and of itself a virtue, but it is using a virtue towards a bad end, which is sinful, to use your you know, natural virtue of piety for, um, for sin. So it's kind of like you have the virtue of piety, but not prudence in choosing the wrong gods to worship. Nevertheless, their natural piety of the Roman people was known for its uh, precision in worship, its discipline in worship, its um, its its uh, its effectiveness in getting across what needs to be getting across. Um, people had great faith in the pagan days, even that uh, the Roman prayers were extremely effective at getting what they asked for, and so that carefulness with language was carried over into the Latin traditional Latin liturgies as the Church of Rome began to use Latin and incorporate that uh, Roman sense of piety into its liturgy. With the construction of the Church's first permanent temples, the preference for the ad orientum prayer posture clearly became dominant. 
In general, this meant that the altar and the congregation both faced east. Now, a lot of the times during the, especially the 60s, people were bringing up the fact that at St. Peter's Basilica, the altar faces the people. And they said, well, look, in the early church, the altar faced the people because of this church. And that's that's not true. Um, the altar had to face that direction because of the, uh, the architectural position that the church was built in, that it had to be built in that way. The altar had to face that direction in order to face east. And it's during the early church when they had mass, um, actually the priest would face east, which was facing the people, but then the people would have his, their backs to the priest because they would also face east because it was emphasized that much in the early church to face east um, because that was the direction from which the Lord would be returning in his second coming. So it's kind of hard to imagine, but at St. Peter's Basilica, yes, the priest faced the people, but the people had their back to the priest. The establishment of permanent altars in the church as soon as that was possible in the 4th century emphasized the sacrificial nature of the altar as the place of the Lord's sacrifice, not a communal table. Additionally, Constantine granted the bishops of the church honors that were originally attributed only to Roman officials, even himself. And so that included uh, people with genuflect to the bishop, which is something they used to do to the, uh, to the emperor only. It also introduced wearing Roman patrician robes uh, by the clergy, um, which would be a clerical outfit used by the uh, clergy inside and outside of the liturgy. It also processionals entering into the mass of the procession that mirrored a imperial Roman dignitary, dignitaries processional. And uh, one element of the processionals that would become common in the mass was the carrying of candles before the bishop that used to be done before the um, leaders of the Roman Senate. But now there'd be, there'd be candles lit before the bishop. And when the mass started, those, bis those candles would be placed beside the altar. So it's not to say that Catholic vestments are just Roman robes. They were also far more adorned than Roman robes would have been. But the basic shape of the vestments that the Catholic bishops would wear were taken from Roman nobility, but far more adorned with a heavenly look and also uh, just adornments showing the cross and symbols of our faith. However, Rome was declining as soon as Constantine converted. Despite his love for the city, as he ruled both the Eastern and Western Emperor, Empire, he chose to rule his united empire from the city of Byzantium, which would become uh, Constantinople, due to its regional influence and its economic prosperity. Rome, on the other hand, was culturally declining along with all of Western Europe. It would continue facing increased pressure from Germanic Goths and even the Central Asian migratory warriors, the Huns. The Roman Church then became somewhat quiet throughout the 4th and 5th centuries. So when people read church history, they tend to find a lot of documents from the 4th and 5th centuries, and they tend to leave reading those documents, sometimes thinking, well, geez, it looks like the Eastern Orthodox, that's really the ancient church. The reason they're getting that sense is because the Eastern churches were the ones that were writing the most during the 4th and 5th centuries. The Rome wasn't writing that much because Rome was really struggling economically and politically. It was really declining rapidly and it was under constant attack from the Germanics. So there wasn't as much time to devote to philosophical musings and for, and for writing in general. So um, despite the lack of record of Roman liturgical developments during the 4th and 5th centuries, the, uh, the 300s and 400s, the church during this period would seem to have rapidly embraced its development of the Latin liturgy because virtually the entire Roman upper class converted to Catholicism as that became the extremely politically popular thing to do after Constantine's reign. So it's just one note here. It's quite likely that during that period of the fourth century, that's when the words ita misa est would have likely been introduced to conclude the sacrifice. And that's where the mass gets its name. The mass in Latin is misa because of the words that were used to conclude the Mass. Misa just used to mean assembly, basically, in Latin, though it directly comes from uh, the Latin word go. So, uh, okay. So as upper-class Romans took positions within the Roman ecclesial hierarchy, the distinctive Roman piety found even more expression in the formulas of the Latin Rite Mass. As I've said before, the Romans were known for approaching religion sort of like engineers, and they were excellent engineers and builders, and they approached uh, religion the same way. So 
while not directing that attitude towards pagan gods anymore, they were now directing that attitude of approaching religion in this kind of mathematical, calculated, very careful way. Um, they would formulate very precise and effective ways of communicating with um, with Jesus Christ and with God the Father. Um, coupled with, uh, you know, concerns, you know, in the church during that time period, um, there was concern in the church about heresy, especially Arianism. So the prayer formulas that would be written and passed down for the traditional Latin mass developed during the 4th and 5th centuries would combine conciseness, efficiency, strong piety, and with theological precision to uh, promote the faith of the Nicene and Constant Constantinople councils and uh, condemn heresy. We can go ahead and say that during this 4th and definitely by the 5th century, the Roman canon was finished. But I would go ahead and definitely say the Roman canon was, and that's the Eucharistic prayer, one of the traditional Latin Mass, the only Eucharistic prayer that the Roman Rite Church knew between the uh, 400s and 1969. It was done being written by the end of the 300s, I would say. And let's look at why. You can compare, um, even though we don't have much on the exact workings of the Roman Rite during the 4th century, we do have the, uh, the formulation of the Ambrosian Rite. So the Ambrosian Rite is the uh, Catholic Mass of the city of Milan. In Milan. It's named after St. Ambrose. It is a distinctive rite to the Roman Rite, and it kind of emerged as its own distinct rite with its own um, popularity and authority because the city of Milan was the most important city of the Western Roman Empire for about 200 years, from about the middle of the 200s to the to the um, you know the 400s as well. It's um, named after him. Let's keep going here. So it presents us with a glimpse of the church, which uh, of the Church of Milan, wh whose liturgy had pretty much everything in common with the Roman Rite Mass that we, you know, inherited in the 1962 Missal in the Roman Rite. Basically, the Ambrosian Rite is essentially identical to the Roman Rite Mass. Now, some hypothesize that the Roman Rite Mass came from the Ambrosian Rite, that the Ambrosian Rite was first, and that because they were the most powerful city and because that rite of the Mass was so popular that Rome went ahead and just did it like they did in, um, in Milan, except adapted a few things. And that's, maybe there's something to be said for that. In all essentials, the Ambrosian Rite is the traditional Latin Mass, um, with the exclusion of the musical styles. Uh, at this period in the 4th century, the Romans would have been engaging in Roman plain chant, which is a very simplified version of Gregorian chant. But in Milan, they were using a very uh, Greek style of chanting, uh, very emotional, very passionate. There was also uh, no Agnus Dei prayer in the Ambrosian Rite. The, Amb the Agnus Dei prayer wasn't in the Roman Rite at that time either. It was added to the Roman Rite in the 7th century. And there was a different Kyrie eleison chant, which is interesting because uh, that didn't make its way into the Roman Rite until Gregory the Great added it in the end of the 6th century. There was also certain other ceremonial differences. In the Roman Rite, the priests wore black cassocks. In the Ambrosian Rite, they were red cassocks. There are six weeks of Advent in the Ambrosian Rite. When the procession takes place, the cross faces backwards in the Ambrosian Rite while it faces forwards in the Roman Rite. The canon of the Mass, however, is basically identical in the Ambrosian Rite and the Roman Rite. The difference is that in the Ambrosian Rite, there's kind of a different list of saints. So the saints that are listed in the canon of the Mass um, the saints that are listed in the Roman Rite reflect saints, most of which are from Rome, but in the Ambrosian Rite, they're different saints. And uh, both in the Eucharistic consecration, both include a the words, uh, a mystery of faith after the consecration of the chalice. There's differences in the words of consecration themselves. So on the video here, I have them. Um, so for example, in the Ambrosian Rite, the Missal said, Jesus, who on the day before he suffered for our salvation and for that of all men, taking bread, he raised up his eyes to the heavens, to thee, God, as Almighty Father, and giving thanks, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Hoc est inam corpus meum. And on the Roman rite, the difference is that there's extra details. It says he took bread into his holy and venerable hands, extra adjectives there. And uh, it said he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye all of you and eat of this. That's the take ye all the and eat of this is not in the Ambrosian Rite. So extremely similar. 
with the exact same words of consecration, Holcastinum corpus meum. Um, so, you know, if you're watching the video, you can pause and take a peek at these differences. There's a slightly different final doxology in the Roman Rite. Um, but in all essentials, they use the exact same Roman canon in the Ambrosian Rite and the, Ambro and the Roman Rite. There were other rites as well throughout Western Europe. Um, besides the Roman Rite and the Ambrosian Rite, there was the Gallican Rite, the Mazarabic Rite, the Celtic Rite. Let's take a look at what the Gallican Rite was. So the Gallican Rite was used throughout Gaul and the Germanic lands. Gaul is modern day France, the same geographical location, but a different group of people living in it. It was a slightly adapt, there was a slightly adapted version of it used in the British Isles and Ireland. Um, it contains some of the prayers that seem to have been inspired by Eastern prayers, so perhaps there was some sort of Eastern influence on the Gallican Rite. There was also a certain preference for the elaborate ceremonies and the mysterious ceremonies of the Eastern Rites in the Gallican Rite, and those kind of elaborate, mysterious things weren't found in the Roman Rite of this period. In reality, um, the Gallican Rite, which is often referred to, is really not much more than a vague outline of a Mass. It does not give very specific prayers and uh, ceremonial instructions as the Roman Rite does. So there was a, considering, a considerable amount of uh, liturgical diversity in Gaul. There was no unifying center there like there was in Italy. There was unifying centers around major cities such as Rome and uh, such as Milan, and so in Gaul, basically, you went to a different town, you had a different experience of the Mass. Not unlike if you go to a different parish, you have a different experience of the Mass, oftentimes today. Numerous, now this was seen as a problem, that there wasn't uniformity, so it wasn't seen as a good thing that there was so much diversity. There were actually numerous councils held by the bishops of Gaul to try to fix that problem. There was the Council of Vannes in 465, Agde in 506, Vaison in 529, Tours in 567, Auxerre in 578, and two councils of Mekon in 581 and 623, all of which tried to address the problem of the um, lack of liturgical unity in Gaul, but none of them could come to any agreements about uh, how to pick the right traditions that everyone would go ahead and follow. Rome was consistently written to for advice about how to settle liturgical agreements with the obvious conclusion that the Gallican Rite would become increasingly Romanized. We're going to see in a little bit about how that process was finished and the Gallican Rite was basically um, erased and uh, replaced by the Roman Rite by Charlemagne in the 8th century. Uh, regardless, the Gallican Rite and the Celtic Rites that are basically Gallican Rites with a bit of a different twist to them are a glimpse of really, I think, the Roman Rite of the second century. They were the basic structure of the Roman Rite, but with much flexibility, which is what we see in Rome in the writings of Hippolytus before it became more formalized when the upper-class Romans entered the Catholic Church in, in mass in the fourth century. There's also the Mazarabic Rite. This is the uh, basically the Western Rite of Spain, centered on the city of Toledo in Spain. It still exists to this day. Uh, Dom Marius Ferreton OSB considered the Masoch Rite, Masorabic Rite, to be a snapshot of general Roman practices of the 6th century, of the 500s, stating that it was essentially the Roman Rite in its ceremonies and prayers, but with the exception of the proper prayers, like the collects of each individual a Mass or feast day, and the readings and the hymns. Uh, the readings, the hymns, and the proper prayers were all different in the Masorabic Rite than in the, uh, the Roman Rite that we know today. The Masoravic Rite had a tendency towards elaborate ceremonies similar to the Gallican Rite, but the Eucharistic prayer of the Masoravic Rite was uh, more distinct from the Roman Canon than the Ambrosian Rite was. Uh, however, you know, the Masoravic Rite was kind of frozen in its development around the uh, 8th century when it was invaded, Spain was invaded by the Moors, and uh, from then on, Catholics in that country would be kind of oppressed. So. The Masoravic Rite kind of froze in its formulation in the first, you know, that, that part of the first millennium, and the Roman Rite would continue to develop gradually. We have the Celtic Rites, okay, so the Celtic Rites we said were very similar to the uh, Gallican Rites. They had also a very loose structure. Um, they generally mirrored the structure of the Roman Rite but had much variation in its choice of readings, its construction of prayers, its styles of music, its choice of hymns. So some attempt has been used to kind of hijack the Celtic rite of the Mass by both kind of <clears throat> 
super progressive neo-Protestant groups, uh, Anglicans and Western Orthodox Christians as well. And they've tried to argue that the existence of this Celtic rite in the first millennium is evidence that the, uh, the British Isles at that time were not Roman Catholic. They were an independent church. Um, the evidence we have of the Celtic rite is mostly found in what's called the Stowe Missal that dates back to the 500s. So, so yes, there was this unique liturgical practice in the British Isles during the 500s, but that's not different from Gaul. That's not different from Milan. That's not different from Spain. All of them had unique liturgical practices distinct from the city of Rome because during that time period, it was not the custom that the Pope would, you know, demand you do things in your country as um, as he celebrates liturgy in Rome. There was a basic structure, but um, there was no liturgical uniformity in the Western Church at that time. And also, during this time period, Celtic bishops in Great Britain participated in multiple councils with Roman bishops, such as the Council of Arles, and that dealt with uh, a heresy in Northern Africa. So the fact that Celtic bishops were participating with Roman bishop, with the Bishop of Rome, and um, not with Roman bishops, sorry, with the Bishop of Rome and other bishops in the Western Church to try to deal with a, a heresy in Africa speaks to the fact that the British uh, bishops were quite a part of the Roman Church. And they also participated in the Council of Rimini in 359. Uh, they were likely Orthodox participants, like many of the bishops were in this council, but uh, little to their knowledge, there was kind of a, a plan to hijack the council for Arian um, for, to make an Arian conclusion. And so, even though they might not have assented to it, they took part in a council that would end up being condemned by the Pope for uh, of asserting Arianist, Arian doctrine. Just like in Gaul, there were Celtic bishops that often requested the intervention of the Pope in liturgical manners, which, just as it did in Gaul, would lead to the gradual Romanization of these liturgies. You know, when two Celtic bishops couldn't decide what to do about the liturgy, they'd ask the Pope, the Pope would decide, and of course he would decide with the sort of customs that he was doing in Rome. And so we have the Roman liturgy. So why did the Roman rite begin to dominate liturgical worship of the Western Church? Why did it end up that it was the rite of Rome that was celebrated all throughout the entire Western Church? There's numerous reasons for that. And one of them that's the most, um, I would say the most provocative is that I would argue in a very real sense, Rome never fell. Let's see what I mean by that. For starters, you know, the Pope was the universal pastor of the church, but he was also the direct patriarch of all the Western churches. He was respected for his role as the direct leader of all of Western Christendom. And I use the word Western Christendom, I use the word Western Europe, but in a sense, all of Western Europe would have identified itself at one time, in a sense, as being a part of greater Rome. Rome was their cultural center, Rome was their religious center, and they considered themselves to be um, participants in this greater Rome. There was not a clear sense amongst the people of this greater Rome that the Roman world had ended in 410 AD as we now have, because in our history books we read, okay, Rome fell in 410, you can Google when, when did Rome fall, you're going to see 410 AD when uh, Romulus Augustulus was um, deposed by the Germanics. But after he was deposed, the Gothic rulers for some time dressed themselves up as Roman rulers, you know? So what's to say they weren't legitimate Roman rulers because they weren't legitimate authorities? The, uh, the emperors of Rome had been claiming the uh, crown by force for centuries, so they weren't any different for doing that. And they wouldn't have been the first German Roman rulers either. There had been many Roman uh, emperors who had been German before, before, um, before this. So in the 6th and 7th centuries, um, the Roman emperor of Constantinople was still recognized as the Roman emperor, and he was still recognized as the emperor of the Western promises, in name at least, even if his influence was basically non-existent. The Roman Empire had not ended. The Roman Empire was still going on, and we know now today that really, politically speaking, they were only really exerting any force over the eastern part of the old emperor, but still, the western part of the old emperor still identified the Byzantine emperor as the one Roman Empire. 
So Western Europeans still define themselves as heirs of the Roman uh, inheritance, even if the political power of the city of Rome itself was basically non-existent. The martial system of medieval Europe, the system of chivalry, really developed continuously out of the Roman martial tradition. There was not a break between the, uh, the Roman military practices and the medieval European ones. There was a continuous progression between them. And the Roman pontiff, once again, was considered the papa, the father, the dad of the Western church. There was, you know, the Aryan Goths and Lombards, these German Aryans, who were politically powerful, and they could have brought unity to Western Europe, but the Pope would have never allied with them because they were, of course, heretics and they were um, Aryans. As soon as an Orthodox ruler emerged in Western Europe who was strong enough to bring political order to Western Europe, he was crowned the Roman Empire of the West. Uh, this man was Charlemagne. Uh, he saw himself as the heir to the continuous Roman tradition, and other people saw him as that as well. He named his kingdom the Holy Roman Empire, and one of the things he's most well known for, especially in this video, is that he imposed the Roman Missal of Rome upon his entire empire. If he was truly identifying himself as a Frank, which he was, but if he was truly identifying himself as a Frank, he would have imposed the Gallican right upon the entire empire. But he really psychologically saw himself, you know, as a son of Rome and now the leader of Rome. Because to them, Rome had not ended. And why has Rome ended to us? Maybe it didn't end. In a sense, it didn't. In a sense, it continued, especially through the guardianship of the Roman Catholic Church. Let's go to uh, Pope Gregory I in 590 through 604. He's known significantly for his reforms of the liturgy. He was at first a monk. He was then sent as a diplomat to Constantinople, where he saw the liturgical practices and the beauty and the aesthetic uh, beauty of the, of the Eastern liturgy. As Supreme Pontiff, he was known for regularizing the Roman Rite Mass and pruning the accretions that had made the rite difficult to pray. It said that it might have taken up to three hours to celebrate the Roman Rite Mass before his pontificate, and so he kind of made it a point of simplifying that a bit, a, a bit down to some sense of moderation. After his reign, the Roman canon remained absolutely set in stone. It was already developed, as I said, by the end of the 300s, but after his reign, not a, not a period, not a comma changed until 1969. Uh, he developed Roman plain chant into the basic musical style known today as Gregorian chant. Though the Gregorian chant we know today is also influenced by Gallican styles of song and influenced by the medieval Cluniac reforms, he also adapted the Greek Great Litany at the beginning of Mass, Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison. He adapted that into the Kyrie eleison of the Roman Mass. Uh, the Greek litany was much longer. The original Kyrie eleison that Gregory the Great introduced into the Mass was, of course, the nine uh, invokings of the of the Lord for mercy. Gregory also directly propagated the evangelization of the English peoples. And uh, so because he was the one who directly sent missionaries to England, they would have received a, uh, a Roman Missal which he, which was in use in Rome at the time. And that would have at least been very influential for them, even though they still had the flexibility to adapt the, the missile according to their own customs. To demonstrate liturgical flexibility in this period, yeah, so even though they received the Roman Missal, the English people um, did not fully accept the Roman Missal in its exact form until the 1100s. In 687 and 701, Pope Sergius I, he introduced the Agnus Dei prayer, the Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. And that um, hymn was to be sung while the bread was being broken. He introduced that hymn in direct response to the iconoclastic movement in the East, because in the East they had recently condemned the depiction of Jesus as a lamb. And so because of that, he decided in the Roman Rite, we were going to start singing to the Lamb of God, basically to... Um, you know, stand up to what the East had done and to show that that was wrong, that you should not condemn that kind of a depiction of Jesus, since the scriptures itself depicts Jesus that way, of course, in the book of Revelation. And uh, the Pope, uh, not Pope, but Charlemagne the Great, um, by the reign of Charlemagne in the uh, 700s, 
the Roman Rite had reached a level of uniformity that it was beginning to be recorded in uh, detailed missals, such as the Gelasian Sacramentary, and uh, before that, the, the Veronine or the Leonine Sacramentary. So these are the very earliest kind of missals. Is not exactly missals, but the very earliest um, detailed descriptions of the Roman Rite Mass. Even though the Roman Rite Mass had become kind of uniformed and standardized by this time, the Gallican and the Celtic Rites were not uniformed, and this was seen as a problem. Um, and the Gallican clerics continuously sought ways to solve this problem. Naturally, the Roman Rite was seen as the solution for uniformity. In general, the Roman prayers, calendar, lectionary, and ritualistic prop practices were propagated throughout the entire Holy Roman Empire. This was the Empire of Charlemagne. He was crowned by the Pope, and he brought um, stability to the entire Western Europe once again. And uh, once again, um, Voltaire is famous for saying that the Holy Roman Empire was not holy, was not Roman, and was not an empire. And uh, he was referring to the Holy Roman Empire of the 18th century, but um, especially when it comes to Charlemagne, you know, why wasn't it? It included Rome. He was considered the legal king of Rome. Uh, it, it was intended to propagate the Catholic faith, and uh, it was an empire. So, well, who's to say that Charlemagne's Roman Empire was not the Roman Empire? All the same, even while Charlemagne's entire Roman Empire, including all of Germany, and uh, Germany at this time included uh, Eastern Germany, which is today known as Germany and Austria, it also included a Western Germany, which is now known as France, um, while they adopted the Roman lectionary and uh, rituals and prayers, they also spread their ceremonies to the Roman Rite, and so they kept some of their extra ceremonials that the Roman Rite hadn't had. So there was a bit of a back and forth between the Gallican Rite and the Roman Rite. Um, the Roman Rite became, uh, especially Gregorian chant, was influenced by the the uh, passionate ceremonies of the Gallican Rite, and uh, some of the extra ceremonies and uh, rituals were included in the Roman Rite from then on. So what's the Low Mass? So starting around the one, well, back even in the 5th century, in the 6th century, St. Augustine and St. Gregory of Tours respectively referenced lay persons making Mass intentions to offer the Mass for a particular intention. As Mass intentions abounded, and as the expectation spread that each church and monastery should offer the Holy Sacrifice each day, customs developed informally for priests to celebrate the Holy Sacrifice privately uh, with the help of just one server, and that server would fulfill the role of the community because there wasn't a community present. This kind of informal um, adaptation of the Catholic Mass, the Roman Rite Mass, to be celebrated with just one priest, would eventually turn into what's called the Low Mass. So the Low Mass is just the priest and the server doing all the prayers. Now, because of its simplicity and perhaps its austerity, lay people started attending Low Masses, and um, they a lot of them preferred that because it was maybe quicker. Uh, and then, um, you know, if, you know, if you're a working person, you can't always attend to hour and a half ceremony, so there's nothing really impious about that if you wanted to attend a 45 one, 45 minute long low mass. When these private low masses between a priest and server were accompanied by chant and music, it would be called the sung mass. And so that's how we get the low mass and the sung mass. The high mass was originally the only type of mass. This is a map of Europe in the 1, 000, year 1000. Um, just notice here uh, what is known today as the Byzantine Empire. Uh, it, w it was never called that historically. Historians call it that, but they always called themselves the Roman Empire. They still have a lot of property or a territory here in, in, uh, in Italy. Uh, Rome is included here with the Empire of the Romans, the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, after Charlemagne's death, the Holy Roman Empire split between the Eastern Holy Roman Empire and uh, West the Western Roman Empire, which is then eventually would be called France. France is a Germanic kingdom, and it is ruled by the descendants of Charlemagne for, for many centuries. Throughout that entire landscape of, uh, of, of nations, of, you know, churches that are looking to Rome as their patriarch, their direct patriarch, um, there was still religious diversity throughout the entire Middle Ages. There was different missiles all radiating around the Roman lectionary and the Roman prayers, but there were different ceremonies and customs in the different regions of the uh, the greater Rome. And as these ceremonies continue to develop, not only in the Roman rite, but in every single Christian rite of ancient origin, there came to be a greater sense of the need to worship the immolated host. 
the development of understanding of the grandeur of the Most Holy Eucharist had a decided effect on the development of ceremony and the liturgy of each ancient Christian rite. In the Eastern Rites, an iconostasis was built, a big wall with the grand doors to conceal the divine terror of the consecration of the body and blood of Christ from the laity. And every Eastern Church to this day has this wall here, and the altar is on the other side of it. You can't even watch the consecration. In the Latin Rite, there was no iconostasis, but there was an emphasis developed on uh, the purification of sin throughout the liturgy and before the liturgy in order to take part in the liturgies. And the elevation of the host, of the fort, that came about in the 14th century so that the laity could better worship the Eucharist. And the ringing of bells along with the consecration, that started around the 12th century to emphasize the, uh, the dignity of the Holy Eucharist, of Jesus' true bodily presence in the Mass. I hope you know that in the previous video we went over numerous, numerous quotes of early church fathers that the belief in the true presence of Jesus' body and blood in the Eucharist, that goes back to the very beginning of the church, to Ignatius in the year 110, who, you know, he learned the Eucharistic faith from Peter himself. But um, these more decided forms of ceremony to truly worship Jesus in the Eucharist, um, they started to find their way more prominently in the Mass, you know, around the year 1000 though they were always present. Um, as I said before, regional flexibility still persisted throughout the greater Roman world, um, and that allowed for, when new ceremonies were developed, um, that allowed for other regions to kind of say, hey, let's, let's do that too, because that's a very effective way to communicate what's going on at the Mass. And so during the Middle Ages, we find introductions of uh, elements of the Mass that we know today are a part of the traditional Latin Mass, including the, the Confidior before Mass, uh, the uh, prayers at the foot of the altar, those came about, oh, I'm sorry, the Confidior came about around the year 1000 before the Mass. Um, the prayers at the foot of the altar, those came about in the late Middle Ages, around the 13, 1400s. The last gospel also found its way to the end of the Mass in the late Middle Ages um, as a as a element of the Mass that was added to, you know, emphasize the importance of uh, Jesus coming among us, the Word becoming flesh. Also, the elaboration of the offertory prayers was a gradual process. And, uh, and, and that's such a beautiful part of the traditional Latin Mass that um, throughout the ages the Church knew that we had to fully um, show proper reverence for what was going to be offered to God, the most holy and perfect sacrifice of the cross in the Holy Eucharist. And then also musically, the formulation of the notes by which the introits, the gradual, the gradual is the traditional Latin Mass's form of what's called the responsorial psalm in the Novus Ordo, and the prayers of the Mass, you know, the, the way in which those prayers were sung in the Gregorian chant, uh, those gradually developed throughout the Middle Ages, especially in the uh, central monasteries of various regions, such as the Monastery of Cluny in, in Germany. The Roman Missal itself received uh, a lot more popularity because the Franciscan friars, who would spread throughout all of Europe, you know, Greater Rome, rather than developing their own Missal like the Dominicans had, they used the Missal of the Pope of Rome. And so they brought those customs throughout Europe and they were appreciated by many people for their noble uh, simplicity and, and for their beauty. So the Latin Rite is a merger of many Western Rites. So uh, as these different regional Rites would develop different practices, the Latin Rite in general that we know today would sort of take the best parts of uh, each of these Rites and incorporate them in the universal practice. And that's kind of how we get the Latin Rite that we know today. And then we get Quo Primam of Pope Pius X, uh, the V, excuse me. You know, the tragedy of Protestantism was uh, one element of Protestantism was an attack against the integrity of the Mass itself. These attacks were leveled against the traditional Latin Mass, but keep in mind also that the attacks against the Mass are also attacks against all ancient Christian liturgies, because the, the doctrines of the, of the traditional Latin Mass are the same as the doctrines against all Eastern uh, liturgies as well. As a result of these attacks, the Council of Trent promulgated numerous dogmas concerning the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Let's take a look at those dogmas so that you can understand um, 
what's so important about the way that the Mass used to be celebrated, because the Church teaches that these dogmas are, uh, are dogmatically true. You cannot believe any one of these are false and still um, be a Catholic. The first one, if anyone says that the Mass is not a true and proper sacrifice to God, or that it has to be offered, or that to be offered is nothing else but that Christ has given us to eat, let him be anathema. So Mass is more than communion, and Mass is a sacrifice. The second one says that um, if you say Christ did not institute the apostles of priests as priests, and that other pre and that um, they could ordain others to offer the body and blood, let him be anathema. The third dogma, if anyone says that the Mass is only a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, or that it is a bare commemoration of the sacrifice consummated on the cross, but not a propitiatory sacrifice, or that it profits him only who receives communion, or that it ought not to be offered for the living and dead for sins, pain, satisfactions, and other necessities, let him be anathema. The next one, if anyone says that by the sacrifice of the Mass a blasphemy is cast upon the most holy sacrifice of cross of Christ consummated on the cross, or that the cross is thereby derogated from, let him be anathema. The next one, if anyone saith that it is an imposture to celebrate Masses in honor of the saints, and for obtaining their intercession with God, as the Church intends, let him be anathema. The next one, if anyone saith that the canon of the Mass contains errors, and it should therefore be abrogated, let him be anathema. In all intents and purposes, the canon of the Mass has been abrogated in the Novus Ordo, because no one ever uses it, except very rarely. So, for all intents and purposes, it has been abrogated. Uh, next one. If anyone saith that the ceremonies, vestments, and outward signs which the Catholic Church makes use of in the celebration of Mass are incentives to impiety rather than offices of piety, let him be anathema. Next one. If anyone saith that Masses wherein the priest alone communicates sacramentally are unlawful and are therefore to be abrogated, let him be anathema. And the next one, if anyone saith that the rite of the Roman Church, according to which a part of the canon and the words of consecration are pronounced in a low tone, is to be condemned, or that the Mass ought to be celebrated in the vulgar tone, tongue only, or that water ought not be fixed with the wine that is ought to be offered in the chalice, for that is contrary to the institution of Christ, let him be anathema. So considering all those dogmas, which Pius V now knows that by the protection of the Holy Spirit, all of those dogmas are infallibly factual and true. Pius V then promulgated the so-called Tridentine Missal. So this missal was a canonization of the liturgical developments of the Roman Rite's first 1,500 years in the light of the recently promulgated liturgical dogmas of the Council of Trent. This missal reflects a slight pruning of the liturgical grandeur of late medieval worship, but it is completely consistent with Roman liturgical tradition dating back to the 4th century. St. Pius V established the Sacred Congregation of Rites to make sure that the Missal was followed faithfully, preventing liturgical adaptation during an age in which Protestant thought could easily creep into the Church at any moment. What happens as a result of uh, Pius V's Cool Primum and the Tridentine Missal? We have one of the greatest periods in Catholic Church history. So even though and tragically, many Germanic kingdoms, Sweden, England, and Scotland, had been lost to ecclesiastical and soteriological heresy. The rest of the church enjoyed a period of incredible liturgical beauty. And uh, the Baroque period emerges uh, as a period of unrivaled beauty and aesthetic glory for the Catholic Church, celebrating the glory of God. And um, the Council of Trent and the papacy of Pius V set up the church for a period of unparalleled success in foreign missions both in the Far East and in the New World, and uh, if you are a Catholic of, you know, Far Eastern Asian heritage or even Latin American heritage, you likely owe your Catholic faith to this period of church history in which the glory of the Catholic Mass likely attracted your ancestors, you know, to come and, and, and worship Christ in the immolated host. So, the Council of Trent, you cannot say was not a success. The Catholic Church entered into one of its most glorious periods because of the Council of Trent. Just beautiful Baroque art. Just a thorough, rich understanding of the glory of the sacrifice of the Mass, clearly handed down to us because of the Council of Trent. And then we have 1750, and we have the birth of the modern world. 
So the modern world is kind of preceded by first the, the reigns of the enlightened absolutist or the enlightened despots, rulers of Western Europe's nations, such as Frederick the Great of Prussia, Catherine II of Russia, Charles III of Spain, Joseph II of Austria. And these kings all radically redefined the role of a monarch as a despot with unlimited power to enact reforms over the state in areas of education, state management, the economy. The, the philosophical... So that revolutionizes the way states are run and um, takes away a lot of people's rights. At the same time, or a little bit after the enlightened absolutist um, period of government, the philosophical so-called enlightenment which was merely the attempt to draw up rationalistic explanations for everything devoid of faith, of the 18th century represented, uh, or represented the beginning of the great rupture in Catholic and Protestant nations between the intelligentsia and the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ both in its Catholic and its heretical versions. Ultimately, the Enlightenment wed to the Industrial Revolution and modern enlightened absolutist states gave birth to what's called the modern world in which we now live. I think we all know that we don't live in a world anything like the Middle Ages, but we don't sit down and think, okay, well, what is it about the modern world that's different? We are not a different species from pre-modern humans. They are the same exact species than us, and if you were to teleport one of them to this world, they would figure it out in the course of a few months. You know, They'd be fine once they learn the language and they figure out what's going on around here because we're the same species. So what exactly is modernity? Why do we feel like we're in such a different world than these people felt like they were in, you know, 500 years ago? Well, I want to offer you a definition of modernity. Not a perfect one. It's just my definition of modernity. I think that the major problem that we have with what's going on in the church since Vatican II and with the uh, reforms of the Mass, the challenges that that presents to us, is that there was never really a very clear definition of what the modern world meant in Vatican II. There was a, basically, you could say that's the whole point of Vatican II, is to define the modern world. But you can't have a definition that's an entire book long, because that, that, doesn't, that doesn't help for understanding what exactly it is. Here's just a sample definition of what modernity is. We have mass-manufactured goods. Capitalism which means banks take a central role in the economy because they give loans to industrial entrepreneurs to help them get started. There's electricity. There's oil. There's a godless educational establishment, which is the directest descendant of the Enlightenment philosophers. I don't mean godless in a horrible, insulting way. I just mean that God is not a part of the equation in the educational establishment of the modern world. There's a wage-based economy centered on industrial production rather than agricultural production. Democracy is the rule of law. It's either based on the American Revolution. It's either based on the French Revolution. It's either based on the British parliamentary democracy. Or if your country has a more recent democracy, it's probably based on the principles of the United Nations. There's a more literate populace due to the effectiveness of an industrial capitalist economy at freeing up all persons from age 5 to 22 from needing to contribute to the workforce. So that's a definition of modernity. More educated, democracy, godless education, mass manufactured goods, electricity, oil, better technology. So what does that mean for the church? Well, in many ways, the so-called modern world is not reconcilable with the Catholic faith. And that's what we have in the entire 19th century and the early 20th century. We have popes acknowledging that the world we seem to be living in, surrounded in as a church, is opposed to the Catholic faith. Um, so Vatican I was called to address the philosophical attacks of the modern world. Um, that was an example of that. That's what Vatican I was called to do, was to defend the church from those attacks. Uh, Pius IX in the 1850s, he defined the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in response to liberal modern attacks on this dogma. Uh, Pius XII in the 1950s, he defined the dogma of the Assumption of Mary into Heaven for the exact same reason. Pius IX condemned um, you know, the kind of attempted marriage of the modern world's principles with the Catholic faith in the Syllabus of Errors. Pius X did the exact same thing in uh, the encyclical Pascendi Domini Gregis. 
both of these condemnations have been thoroughly vindicated with time. There is a lot of issues with the modern world, the modern culture, with the Catholic faith. So there's a lot that can't be reconciled between a lot of the underlying principles of the modern world and the Catholic faith. However, it can't be ignored that there is a huge cultural shift in uh, the way in which Catholics of the 20th century find their lives built. And um, the kind of way that the church culturally functioned throughout the entire medieval period, which had now ended. Nothing except the Catholic Church was uh, still upholding kind of the principles of the medieval world, which were good principles, which uh, were built upon the Catholic faith. But a lot of Catholics were confused because, um, you know, they lived in a modern world and their um, the Catholic Church was rightly condemning the modern world. Um, but there was still a gulf between their everyday experience and perhaps what they were seeing at church. Is there necessarily a problem with that gulf when the modern world is extremely opposed to the Catholic faith? Um, you could definitely argue there wasn't a problem with that gulf. The modern world had a lot of issues and the Catholic church was refusing to get on board with it. And the Catholic church was doing extremely well throughout the entire 20th century and was growing at, a, at, alarm, at a very uh, rapid rate in the 50s with foreign missions and with seminarians all across the board. Church attendance was very high. However, you could argue that the cultural shift that Catholics had found themselves in from the period in which their liturgy had been crafted was similar to the cultural shift that had happened in Rome in the uh, 3rd century when the Roman Rite Mass changed from Greek to Latin to kind of change with the culture of the people living in Rome. So you could argue that um, the liturgy should have reformed to sort of meet where the people were living in the modern world. The liturgical movement of the 20th century kind of formed to try to brainstorm ways to help modern man access the Roman Rite Mass. And uh, when John the 23rd called the Second Vatican Council, a huge part of that was to uh, help consider if the Ro ancient Roman Rite Mass might need to be modernized to be acceptable to modern man in similar ways that the Mass had been Romanized to be more acceptable to the more culturally Roman people of the 3rd century in the Church of Rome. Uh, so this is Pope Paul VI. Pope Paul VI is um, definitely made Pope during Vatican II after John XXIII died because he was completely pro modernize the church. He still had reservations, but he was much more in favor of modernizing the church than other clerics were. And that's kind of what the popular thing to do was during the Second Vatican Council. This is the man that Paul VI entirely trusted with the Roman Rite. He put the entire Roman Rite in this man's hands. His name is Annabel Bugnini, uh, and uh, Paul VI entrusted him to lead the commission to determine how the Roman Rite would be modernized after it was decided that it would be modernized. And the fruit of that was the Novus Ordo Missal, the uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Vatican II document on the liturgy, was principally written with Annabel Bugnini in charge of the commission writing it. He was also the principal author of the Missal because he was the secretary of the committee known as the Concilium, which wrote the Novus Ordo Missal. The clear underlying attempt of the Novus Ordo Missal was to make the Mass modern. You know, you could say a lot of things about the Mass, but that was the number one goal, was to make it a modern Mass for modern man. How did it go? Well, since they promulgated the modern Missal, uh, Mass attendance in virtually every single Western nation has dropped from 80 to 95%. And amongst those who still go to church, belief in the true presence of the Eucharist, not even transubstantiation, but just the true presence of the Eucharist, which is something that Martin Luther believed, has dropped to 30% of those who go to church. So, let alone those who don't go to church, the belief in transubstantiation—we don't even, we don't even know the numbers. People who fully submit to that dogma, which, by the way, Vatican II never uses that word transubstantiation once. Legitimate questions must be asked: uh, What exactly was meant by modern man by the writers of the Vatican II documents and their authoritative interpreters, such as Annabel Bonini? Was a specific definition held in mind, or was each reformer? left to his own interpretation of what exactly modern man meant. Also, how can we be certain that the modern world which the Holy Mass was adapted for was not a part of the modern world which numerous pontiffs identified as being completely incom incompatible with the Catholic faith? 
you know, I will present a unique argument concerning the Nova Sword Missile that there, um, I will say that there is very reasonable reforms in it, that there's good reason to think we're, you know, fair reforms. Archbishop uh, Marcel Lefebvre even voted for, you know, a lot of these reforms that I have listed here when he voted yes to Sacrosanctum Concilium. There's many others that you have reason to question. And when I say reason to question, I don't mean you're absolutely condemning them and you're saying absolutely awful, these things are awful, but you are saying that uh, I have a legitimate question about why this reform took place I have not been given a good answer to. Um, if I have been given an answer, and I've been reading on this topic for years, it's not a good one. Uh, it's easily dismissed in a few seconds. Uh, okay, so reasonable reforms that the Novus Ordo Missal has. The extension of vernacular to prayers and readings. If everyone in the pews was reading a missal, there's not that much grounds to say it shouldn't just be read in English out loud. Because if everyone's just reading it in English, why not just say it in English? Um, there's reason to think there's, you know, it made sense to have the laity respond directly to the responses uh, of the Mass, which the server used to respond for them. There was, you know, reason to say, okay, fine, you can have the prayers of the faithful in the Mass, there's nothing wrong with that. Or um, even expanding the lectionary to include more scripture, or including a, a weekly lectionary, that's a reasonable reform as well. Questionable reforms. Everywhere you go, the entire Mass is in vernacular. You don't hear any Latin anywhere basically speaking. Why is that? The Council of Trent says it's a dogma that you shouldn't say the Mass should be said in only vernacular. Why was the Kyrie reduced from nine invocations to three? What's the reason for that? Um, why don't we genuflect in Mass when we cross the altar anymore? Why does the priest not genuflect anymore? Why does he act like the tabernacle is not there during Mass, except for his genuflection at the beginning and end of Mass? Why is there no more genuflection during the Creed when we say... Um, you know, he took flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Why did they remove the prayers at the foot of the altar? What's the reason for that? Um, they really did help appreciate and teach reverence for going on to the altar. Why was the last gospel removed? There's never been a good explanation for that offered. Um, why are there three new Eucharistic prayers? What's wrong with the Roman canon, which the church held on to for, you know, 1,700 years? Um, why does the second Eucharistic prayer only include one very vague reference to a sacrifice? It says in the second Eucharistic prayer, we offer you the bread of life and the chalice of salvation. And that's it. Why isn't there any more reference to sacrifice in that Eucharistic prayer? Why have the offertory prayers been erased from the traditional Latin Mass and replaced with a Jewish prayer of blessing? Why were the altar rails removed? Why are people basically expected to stand and receive communion in the hands? What was the reason for that change? Why was the Confidior before communion removed? Why was the intercession to Mary, Michael the Archangel, John the Baptist, and Peter and Paul in the Confidior omitted? Um, why do none of the Eucharistic prayers pray that uh, the Mass be offered for the honor of the saints, like the Roman Canon does? Why does the priest pray facing away from the tabernacle throughout the entire Mass? Why doesn't he look to the tabernacle at least a little bit during the prayers? Why was the basically the entire sacred music tradition omitted and uh, erased and replaced by popular hymns? Why can't we have the traditional music of the church? Why has the uh, Munda Cormeum been uh, shortened to no longer include a reference to the burning coal of the book of Isaiah? Why was the patent practically abolished from the distribution of Holy Communion so that the Holy Eucharist doesn't fall on the ground? Even though the Roman uh, rubrics still require that, nobody follows it. Why are there pianos in sanctuaries? Why does it have to be up there? Why can't it be in the back of the church like it used to? Why is there such an extreme emphasis on community, as though that's the center of the liturgy, and not on the immolated, sacrificed flesh and blood of Christ? Why was the Lord I am not worthy prayer reduced to one recitation instead of three? And finally, why is the canon said out loud when the uh, Council of Trent condemns the proposition that you don't think it should be whispered? The Council of Trent says dogmatically, it's okay to whisper the canon, and uh, church tradition says that that's the wise way to pray the canon. So anyways, those are questions I have. Maybe you have an answer for me. You know, I'm not saying that I'm absolutely right that these things seem like they're bad reforms, but uh, I do have questions, and no one's ever answered me, so. And I don't think there is very good answers out there, but maybe there is. And if there is, I'd love to hear them. Let's review throughout these last two videos. Um, the Last Supper turned a meal of bread and wine into a literal renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. 
the first renewal of the cross, or, you know, foreshadowing of the cross, was in the midst of a Passover meal, but the subsequent breaking of the breads would take place in typical bread and wine meals. Okay, immediately the church recognized the sacrificial nature of the breaking of the bread and the true presence of Christ's flesh and blood in this sacrifice. Aware of this nature and of the word of God's preference for adornment of sacrifices with ceremony and dignified honors, the church began to adorn the Eucharist with such ceremonies. The skeleton of all liturgies was well developed by the time of Justin Martyr and for all reasons was probably developed by the year 60, by, by way before then. The Roman Rite was originally one in custom with the Greek Church, but began to adopt Latin customs in the 190s and continued throughout the 3rd and 4th century. The similarities between the Ambrosian and the Roman Rite indicate a well-developed Roman Rite Mass by the 5th century. The Roman Canon was the treasured Eucharistic prayer of virtually all Western Rites of the Mass, until 1969. While liturgical diversity was the rule of the West, a gradual progression towards a unified practice, mostly taking Rome as its model, took place throughout the medieval period, culminating in Quo Primum's promulgation of the canonized mass in the 16th century, which led to a great period of, uh, of Roman Catholic flourishing. The dawning of the modern world led to the construction of the Novus Ordo Missal, though a lack of a clear definition of what exactly was meant by modern man and what parts of modern man should be appealed to in this mass, uh, while what parts should continue to be condemned, as previous pontiffs had condemned, was not clearly outlined in the construction of the mostly unsuccessful missal by all available statistics. Let's pray that this video gives glory to God, and that anything I've said that does not please God be removed from your minds. In nomine Patri et Filii et Spiritui Sancto. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Sicut erat in principio et in principio et in principio. God bless you and see you soon. Bye.